We're so excited you're here. What's up, church? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Anybody ready to worship Jesus today? Come on, we started singing this one last week. Sing it with me. Let's go. Goodbye yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old ways. Praise the Lord. I've been born again. Goodbye yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old ways. Come on. Praise the Lord. I've been born again. Yeah, we're praising our Lord today. Come on, put your attention on Him today. Put your affection on Him. Come on, sing it. Again and again and again and again. You rescued me out of the mess I was in. You traded my sorrows for something to sing. Now I'm dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Goodbye yesterday. I'm living in the light of a new day. I won't waste another minute in my old singing. Praise the Lord, I've been born again. Goodbye yesterday, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've got resurrection in my veins. Praise the Lord, I've been born again and again and again and again. You rescued me out of the mess I was in. You traded my sorrow for something to sing. Now I'm dancing on the grave that I once lived in. Rescue me out of the mess I was in it. You trained in my soul for something to say. Now I'm dancing on the grave that I want to say. Come on, aren't you thankful for Jesus today? I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind the cross before, and I won't turn back. I have decided. To follow Jesus With the world behind the cross before And I won't turn, no I won't turn back Sing it! No I won't turn back No I won't turn back No I won't turn back No I won't turn No I won't turn back Come on sing it! No I won't turn back The world behind Cross before, and I won't turn again and again and again and again. You rescued me out of the mess I was in. You trained my soul for something to sing. Now I'm dancing on the grave that I want to live in again and again and again and again. You rescued me out of the mess I was in. You trained my soul for something to sing. Now I'm dancing on the grave that I want to live in. Welcome to Rocky. Glad that you guys have joined us today. If you're new here, I'd love for you to swing by our new here table. My name is Nick. I'd love to get a chance to say hi. Also, we have a gift for you. And this could be your first Sunday. A, a few weeks ago, we had someone stop by. There. They said, I've been here for three months. So I don't care if you've been a year. Uh, if it still feels like this church is new to you, please swing by. And uh, like I said, we have a gift for you today. Uh, we're going to continue worshiping in just a minute, but I wanted to celebrate a couple of things. Uh, last week was our baptism celebration. We had 19 people get baptized between both of our campuses. And we have a few more today that we're going to be celebrating. Uh, God is up to something. I'm just so grateful to see life change happen and, and people respond in faith. If you have questions about baptism, find one of us, talk to us. We'd love to answer them and uh, love to just help you take that next step in your journey. Also, Last week, we started uh, Stock the Pantry, this partnership with three local schools to feed 55 families that they specifically know need our help. And uh, before the last, our first service was over last week, all 55 boxes from our impact table were taken. Isn't that cool? Yeah. 
And, and we still have a few gift cards if you want to participate in that way, grab those uh, today. So it's a huge win that we took the boxes. The next step, maybe even more importantly, we need to bring them back, right? So uh, next week is the last week to bring those back and we wanna bless those families. We have more opportunities ahead, so pay attention. We, we know that you guys love to be involved with that. So we're gonna continue worshiping through, through singing. And uh, I, I wanna ask you today, what are you worshiping? Like, what are you grateful for? What's, what's on your mind? I want to share this from Philippians chapter four. In verse four, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he starts talking about anxiety, how it's kind of the opposite of worshiping God. He says, we should not be anxious about anything, but, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, we, we approach God in verse eight. I love this. This has become one of my favorite verses. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. There's so many things today that will consume our minds and pull us away from what God wants us to experience. So today, let's make a decision to focus on what is good and pure and noble and praiseworthy, and that is where our praise will come out of. So let's continue to worship together today. Let's encourage one another. Let's focus on God. He's good. He's worth our song. Let's keep singing. Yeah, we got some baptisms during this one. So come on, church. Let's celebrate, y'all. Did you ever think that it could be this good? That he paid the debt my effort never could. Oh, the sin in me I couldn't shake. Like the sand in turn, he washed away. There's nothing like the power. God, amen. Have you ever known a love like this? One that chose to stay when all the others left. Every time I think I'm too far gone, there is.
holy God in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. If I know my Father, I know my Father. Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. You guys can have a seat. We're going to take communion together. Good plans, hope, and future. Oh. He's our provider, our protector. And, church, I just want you to be reminded today that in the whirlwind of that last week and just the craziness of our world, we can stand here today in confidence that the Lord is on the throne. And that we got nothing to fear because he is good and he goes before us and he establishes our steps. So there's a confidence in this room today.
that God, I trust you with all my heart because I know you got plans for me, God. And you're just getting started. So thank you, Lord. So right now we're gonna take communion. We take the juice that represents his blood that was poured out on the cross and the bread that represents his body. Maybe even look at the cross today and say, wow, thank you for going, going to the cross for me, Jesus, to give me this reality, to give me this proximity to you. We trust you, Lord, with all our heart. We know that you're for us. And if that's true, nothing can stand against. So take some time. Get in front of him. Jesus, today, would you remind us of who you are? The Lord of heaven and earth, the king of the universe, king above all other kings. God, I love that you're not just up there in heaven ruling from afar, but God, you're so close and involved in our lives. We care about the details. And time and time again, you pull us through You bless us again. You forgive us again. And so, Jesus, today we worship you, of course, for who you are and for what you've done. And so, Jesus, anybody in this room or watching today is just feeling super distracted. Maybe they feel like their anxiety is winning more often than usual. God, I pray that today would be a day where, by your spirit, you would start to, like, center us again that we remember you're in control, God. I can trust you with all my heart and you will make the path straight. And so we trust that, Jesus. Yeah, God, we love you so much and we're so excited for today. Open us up because we wanna look way more like you when we leave today. So help us, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, what's up, church? Good morning. Say hey to our Fred campus. Nywat Campus, everybody watching online today, so glad to be together. If you don't know me, my name's Amanda. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And today we are continuing in our series, The Raven and the Prophet. And so we're in week three. We're going to be picking up in 1 Kings chapter 19 today. So if you want to get there, you can go ahead and do that. But before we get there, I want to just do a little recap of the last two weeks. Just in case you missed for some reason, you should definitely go back and listen to those. But just a little recap of where we are. So we're we're talking about Elijah, the life and story of Elijah. And at this point, we know a few things. We know that Elijah has been called by God to confront this evil king named Ahab. Now, this is a little history on Ahab. Ahab was um, probably number 19 in this reign of evil kings, and I think that spanned over about 58 years, so a long time of evil kings. And now Ahab is, is reigned there, and he's evil, like the worst of the worst of all of these kings. And then sometimes, you know, we have a good and a bad, right? But Ahab is actually married to Jezebel, and she is evil also, not good. So we've got bad and bad. So this is what um, Elijah is up against. This is what he has to confront. And maybe just a little bit about the world that Elijah was probably living in. 
Elijah's world probably looked a little bit like how our world looks. I mean, we might feel similar. It kind of was uh, a lot of chaos, upheaval, tra change, transition, just some craziness that Elijah was living in. So that's what he's, he's up against. And if we go back to week one, Matt kicked us off in 1 Kings 17. And this is where we were at the beginning of Elijah's life. And this is the reminder from week one. God uses difficult seasons and circumstances in our life to prepare us for something greater. So God had put Elijah in some, some difficult situations. There was a he, drought and provision at the Kareth Ravine. And then he, he met the widow, and there was the miracle of the widow's oil and flour. And then there was this raising of the widow's son from the dead. So all these difficult things are happening, but God is showing up. And then we go to 1 Kings 18. So week two, last week, Matt left us with this reminder. Above anything else in our lives, God wants to be number one and have all our hearts. And this is the thing that's easy to say and hard to live out. Because what Matt was talking about is that we all have some false idols, false gods in our lives. He refu uh, re re referred to those as like big G God, God, and all these little G gods that we sometimes fill our lives with, right? That can be money, time, all kinds of different things. But that's where we left off last week. At the end of chapter 18, we see Elijah and he definitely seems to be winning kind of this battle with Ahab during this time. Because at this point in, in his life, like I said, God's showing up. We see his faithfulness. We see some miracles happening. I mean, at the very end of the chapter, we see this showdown with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And Elijah calls down fire and God shows up and it's, it's an amazing thing. And then we see um, rain come after a three-year drought. So Elijah has all these victories. Really, at this point, he could, should kind of be like on cloud nine, right? Celebrating. But what we see as we go to chapter 19 is this. We see Elijah face this really powerful emotion that I think we can all relate to. And that emotion is fear. And that fear for Elijah, it led to discouragement, to a little bit of depression, and almost paralyzed Elijah from being able to move forward. So that's where we're picking up today. We're going to be in 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 1. It says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Jezebel is out for Elijah, and Elijah said, was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. So here is Elijah. He's under this tree. He's, he's had enough. And remember, this is a man who has just called down fire from heaven, Right? He had a victory on Mount Carmel, but he hears this one little thing that Queen Jezebel wants to kill him, and in that moment, he forgets everything that God's done. All the ways that he showed up, all the miracles, out the window. And instead, Elijah's response in that moment to Jezebel is to run as far as he can. I mean, he becomes completely overwhelmed with fear in this moment. And he isolates himself. You see that we, he said he dropped his servant off. He wants to be alone. He just wants to go and die. He wants God to take his life. 
And I want to stop right there for a minute in the story of Elijah, because this is what I think. I think on some level, every single one of us in this room can relate to that, that emotion, that emotion of fear. It's something we all struggle with. And some of us might feel it deeper than others, but I think we can all say we've had times in our life where we've forgotten all the ways God has showed up, all the good he's done in our lives, and we become overwhelmed with fear, with discouragement, and sometimes that fear and that discouragement, it leads to depression. And we need to be reminded from Elijah's story today that fear can and does strike all of us, every single one of us. And even the most faithful followers of Jesus can be overcome by fear. And just for the fun of it, and because we can, you know you can Google anything, I decided to Google how many recorded fears are there. And it turns out you can Google anything, but there isn't an answer for everything. Because there wasn't an answer for that. I think it's too vast. There's too many fears to put a number on that. So that isn't what I got when I Googled. Instead, I got this. Do you know that there's over 500 defined phobias? And this is what a phobia is. The definition is this. It's an intense fear that causes distress or it's an irrational fear of something that's actually unlikely to cause harm. It's just this irrational fear. But there are over 500 of those documented. And so just for the fun of it, I want to share a few of these with you. Maybe you Maybe you have some of them. I don't know. I developed some of them while I did this list that I didn't know I had. So first one, hemophobia, fear of blood. That's kind of common. A lot of people have fear of blood. Second one, misophobia, fear of germs. I think we translate that as a germophobia a lot of times, which I think we can relate. The third one is vestophobia, fear of clothing. I don't think I want to meet anybody who has that phobia. The next one is linenophobia, which is a fear of string. It actually said that these people just have this anxiety anytime they see a piece of string. Can't imagine. Second, or la- next one is electorophobia, which is a fear of chickens or hens. I said I'm pretty sure I had this one when I was a kid, which I'll tell that story later, but brontophobia, which is a fear of thunder, which I know our daughter had this when she was growing up, and it was crazy. Next one, this is the one I didn't know I had until I saw it. Hippopotamon phobia, fear of long words. I bet you have that fear now, don't you? And this is the number one rarest phobia that I found when I looked this up. Iraqi buterophobia, which is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. I mean, I didn't know that these things existed, but what I learned from looking these up is that this idea of fear, it runs deep. And sometimes it's irrational, but it's something that we all deal with. And obviously, this this isn't the kind of fear that Elijah was dealing with. I mean, Elijah, I think it's easy to look at the story and say, Elijah's dealing with the fear of Queen Jezebel coming to kill him and that he's going to die. That's the easy answer. I think a little deeper in Elijah's story is maybe Elijah had a little bit of fear of what God was calling him to. He's calling him to confront this king, and he's worn out. And we know that this fear causes Elijah to to flee, to isolate himself, to become depressed. He probably is a little bit irrational in this moment. And I think the question for all of us now is, is, how does God respond to Elijah in that moment of fear? 
How does God respond to us in our moments of fear? Because when we pick up in verse five, what we're about to do, Elijah's under this tree. He's completely distressed. I mean, he's, he's had enough. So verse five says this, then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. So it's funny, Elijah's so out of it, so exhausted. Can you imagine he's laying under this tree? He looks up, there just happens to be some food there. Doesn't really even acknowledge how that food got there. Eats it and just lays back down. And I'm not sure about you, but when I read that part of the passage, I kind of start to wonder, like, what do we expect God to do in that moment? How do we expect him to react? Because I think a lot of us would expect him to react the way that we sometimes react to each other when someone's hurting or fearful, depressed, discouraged. But this is what God does. Instead of, he he doesn't chew Elijah out. He doesn't give him a lecture He doesn't say, pull it together, Elijah. Be stronger. Stop crying. This is God's will. It's all going to be fine. That's not what God does in Elijah's fear. But instead, you know what he does? While Elijah's lying there under a tree, depressed, completely distraught, and overwhelmed by fear, we get to see this amazing picture of the heart of God towards people who are hurting. He doesn't chastise him. He doesn't condemn him in that moment. Instead, he meets Elijah in his weakness with grace and compassion. I mean, he sends an angel in that moment to give him food and water to let him rest. That's how God responds. And I think the reminder for us today in that is that God sees us in our humanity. He knows our fears. He knows our needs. He knows our limits. And when fear overwhelms us, God responds with compassion and care. He wants to come alongside us and he wants to give us strength and renewal. When fear wants to remove us from our calling, God wants to renew us. And if we go on in verse 7, it says this, Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. And I want to focus for a minute on that, that line, The journey ahead will be too much for you. Because when it comes to overcoming fear, I think most of us in our lives, we can relate to that statement. We get overwhelmed with fear and discouragement and sometimes depression, and it feels like I can't go on. The journey is too much. And as we know, that's where Elijah is. He's depressed. He's exhausted. He's been triggered by the fact that Jezebel wants to kill him. And God wants to meet him in a new way in that moment. So he sends an angel, he refreshes him, and then God sends Elijah on a 40-day journey. So on this long journey, and eventually Elijah arrives at this place called Mount Horeb, which I think um, if you look into that, a, a lot of scholars would say that that mountain is actually Mount Sinai, which is where God met Moses. And so we see this as a frequent place that God meets people. So God meets Elijah there. So he goes up to the mountain, and we pick up in verse 9. It says this, There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So in this moment, Elijah starts pouring out his heart to God. He's expressing all of these things. He's lonely. Again, he's depressed. 
He has fear and anger. He's probably at an all-time low in his faith in this moment of trusting God. He's remembering all of his losses, none of the good that God did. And he's saying, I'm all alone. I'm doing this all by myself. So Elijah, he's pretty much having a pity party in this moment. You know, you ever had one of those where you're like, I'm, I'm all alone, nobody's helping me, doing everything by myself. That's what Elijah's doing in this moment. And again, God's response in this moment, I love it, because he doesn't try to fix Elijah. He doesn't start giving him a lecture to pull him out of some pit. But instead, God sends Elijah to a cave. Now, it's kind of funny because I don't know that if I was, you know, dealing with someone who was depressed and fearful and distraught, that the place that I would send them would be a cave. Because last time I checked, caves are dark and cold and not always a fun place to be. And in fact, a little story for you. A couple weeks ago, we were in Kenya. We took a team of 33 to there. We had an amazing trip. But one of our days, we actually took our sponsor kids on a field trip. And so we went to this place that's called Paradise Lost. Um, it's kind of like a big park situation. And there was a lake you could go and take your kids boating. And there was a zip line where the kids could like zip line over the lake. And then there was a, a hike. I say a hike in quotes because in Kenya they call it a hike. In Colorado we would call it a walk. Um, but you go up this path and there's this waterfall that's super cool. And so we stopped and took pictures of that. And then when you walk along around the, the waterfall, you can actually go into a cave back behind there. So we've got all of our little kids, and we go back behind the waterfall. And to get into this cave, you, you really got to duck down so that you don't hit your head, because you've got to go through this really narrow spot to get into the cave. So we're in there, all in the line. I'm kind of towards the front of the cave, and it's super dark, and we have no flashlights. And so some of us start turning on our phone to, to give some direction, and we keep walking. And like I said, I'm first in there, so I kind of go to the back of the cave. Everybody starts filling in. And there's only one way in and one way out of the cave. And like I said, we've got all our little kids. There's a guide with us, and he's like explaining, yeah, the water used to go over the cave, and now it goes around and whatever. And for some reason, in that moment... I, to my knowledge, I've never been afraid of, to be in a cave before. But all of these irrational fears started overwhelming me. I was sure that today was going to be the day after hundreds of years that the water was going to come crashing through the cave. All the rocks were going to fall. I was at the back of the cave. I was going to have to run through all of these people to try to get out, duck down, hit my head. I mean, I actually had to take a breath and tell myself, Stop. What is this irrational fear? And that's where Elijah is. He's in a cave by himself. And this is what God does. He says, Elijah, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. So we have all of these powerful ways that we think God is going to show up. A powerful wind gust in the mountain, but God's not in the wind. A powerful earthquake along the ridge, but God's not in the earthquake. A powerful fire, but God's not in the fire. All those displays of power, and that's not where God shows up. But a gentle whisper that rustles through the valley, that's where God spoke. And when Elijah heard that, he actually covered his face and he turned at the glory of God because God spoke in that gentle whisper. 
And that, that gentle whisper, the translation of that, in some translations, that's actually translated to the sound of sheer silence or thin silence or stillness. So at the edge of that cave, in the sound of sheer silence, Elisha meets God there. That's where he hears him. That silence spoke volume. And Elisha wasn't really asking for a word in that moment. And I think so often when we're in the midst of fear and discouragement and all of those places, we don't, we're not asking for a word from God. But I believe that the reason that Elijah heard them, him in that moment, might just have been because of the natural consequence of the silence. And I think the lesson for us in all of this is that when we become overwhelmed with fear, sometimes we look for God in just like the big, immediate solutions. But I think God speaks most clearly in the quiet moments. I think in those quiet moments, God's inviting us to trust him. He's inviting us in that moment to be reassured of his presence, of his power. That's what he did with Elijah. And then if we go on to verse 13, God asks Elijah a second time, Elijah, what are you doing here? And after all of these things, after being fed and tended uh, to by an angel of the Lord, after experiencing God in that gentle whisper, in that silence, that stillness, so much that he turned his face. He was overwhelmed by his glory. After all of that, you know how Elijah responds? In verse 14, he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Sound familiar? That's exactly what Elijah said back in verse 10. Those exact words. Not one word different. And I think for a lot of us in that moment, we would have ran out of compassion and grace. We would have been like, Elijah, get it together. What is wrong with you? But he just couldn't do it. And again, God comes along and he gives Elijah just the bit of direction and clarity that he needs. Just enough to put him back on his feet to keep him moving. In verse 15, he says, Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshai, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elijah son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahalo, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal and kissed him. So this is what God does. God gives Elijah a new mission. God's response to Elijah's fear, it isn't to remove him from his calling, it's to renew him. He comes alongside him and he says, Elijah, you're not alone. There's 7,000 other faithful people. He gives him a purpose. He reignites his hope in this, in this moment. And this is the thing about fear. Fear often makes us feel purposeless, makes us feel unworthy. Fear wants to remove you from your calling, but God wants to renew it. God doesn't want to leave you in that place. He wants to remind us of our calling, of his plan, of the truth that we're never alone. And just like God came along and he, he redirected Elijah, he gave him purpose, he gave him clarity. That's what he wants to do in our fear. He wants to come alongside of us. He wants to transform that into renewed strength and purpose. He wants to give you peace. He wants to, you to know that you're known, that you're loved. And God may not, and he often does not speak in those big ways that we think. 
Instead, he meets us in that quiet place, in the stillness. Psalm 46.10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And as believers, we know this. We have this reassurance from Jesus in Matthew 28.20. He says, I will be with you always until the ends of the earth. See, Jesus, he overcame the ultimate fear, which was death. And because of that, we have victory in him. And in our moments of fear, he wants to come alongside us. He wants to give us rest and renewal and reminding of who we are, of what our purpose is, that we can trust him. He wants to replace our fear with hope. So as we wrap up today, I just want to challenge you with three questions for you to just maybe think about this week. And the first one would be this. What do you need to do this week to rest? I mean, do you need to take a nap? Because I think one of the most spiritual things that you could do this week or maybe today is to go home to rest, to get some sleep. And the second thing is this. What is God asking you to do? We know that fear will remove us from our calling, but God wants to renew it. Does he want to renew something in you? What is he calling you to? Go and do it. And the third thing is this. What do you need to be reminded of? I mean, maybe you need to put a daily reminder in your phone. Maybe you need to do that right now. Maybe you need to be reminded that you're not alone, that you don't have to be afraid. Maybe you need to be reminded to take a quiet moment with Jesus. I have this app on my phone, and it's called Pause. And twice a day, morning and afternoon, I just get a reminder to pause. And for me, I need that in my life. I need to be reminded to stop, to look up, to see what God's doing in that moment, maybe to pay attention to the person in front of me, maybe to listen to what he's saying to me in that moment. So what do you need to do this week? And I want to invite our worship teams at both of our campuses right now to come. And I've asked them to sing this song. It's called Fear Is Not My Future. And during this song, you, you can sit and just maybe think about these questions, reflect, sit with Jesus. You can stand and worship whatever God's calling you to. But the lyrics to this song say this, Fear is not my future, you are. Sickness is not my story, you are. Heartbreak's not my home, you are. Death's not the end, you are. And I think these words remind us that whatever fear and struggle and heartbreak that we might have, that doesn't define us. God does. He's our future, our healing, our hope. And as we sing this today, we want to be reminded, fear says your story ends here. That's not what God says. God says, I'm not finished yet. Fear doesn't have the last word with us. Jesus does. And so today, as we sing, we get to be reminded. We, we can say goodbye to fear. We can say hello to hope. And we can do that with confidence because with Jesus, with God, fear is not our future. Let him turn it in your favor Watch him work it for your good He's not done with what he started He's not done until it's good 
Let him turn it in your favor Watch him work it for your good He's not done with what he started He's not done until it's good So hello peace, hello joy, hello love Hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon Hello peace, hello joy, hello love Hello strength Hello, hope it's a new horizon If you're ready for a breakthrough Just open up and just receive Cause he's not done with what he started It's unlike you've ever seen So hello peace, hello joy, hello love Hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon Hello peace, hello joy, hello It's a new horizon Fear is not my future You are, you are Sickness is not my story You are, yeah, you are Heartbreak's not my home You are, you are Death is not the end, Jesus, you are, you are. Oh, fear is not my future, you are, you are. Oh, sickness is not my story, you are, you are, you are. Oh, heartbreak's not my home, you are, you are. Death is not the end You are, you are, you are Hello peace, hello joy, hello love Hello strength, hello hope, it's a new horizon Hello peace, hello joy my story you are you are you are heartbreaks not my home you are you are you are death is not the end you are 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 So goodbye fear, goodbye guilt, goodbye shame Goodbye pain, goodbye grave, it's a new horizon Goodbye fear, goodbye guilt, goodbye shame Goodbye pain, goodbye grave, it's a new horizon Thank you, Lord. It's a new horizon. Amen. Yes, church, let's stand together. Oh, thank you, Lord, for who you are. First John says that his perfect love casts out all fear. 
So church, today we're leaning into his love that carries us through crazy seasons, through trials and triumph alike. His perfect love casts out all fear. So church, we can trust him with all of our heart. He will make our paths straight. That is the God that we sing to today. That is who he is. Oh man. So Jesus, we love you. We love that this is our reality. That God, we get to live in your love, a love that we don't deserve, but God, over and over again, you show us your love and your grace and your forgiveness. It's just crazy, Jesus. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen. Church, aren't you thankful for Jesus today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, it's been so good being here together today. Hope you have an awesome rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you again next week. See you guys.